morning. I brought some good news this morning. It's in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 15. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. And I impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. Then you lie down, and when you get up, tie them as a symbol on your hands, bind them on your forehead, write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore your fathers to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build. Houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide well you did not dig. Vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then you eat <coughs> when you eat are satisfied and are satisfied. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Fear the Lord your God, serve him only, and <coughs> take your oath in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the people around you. For the Lord your God, who is among you, is a jealous God, and his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. So be it. without it okay so I entitled this the lamb slain so that you can worship because so many times as Christians we think that Jesus is our lamb that was slain for us so that we can be saved maybe even so that we can live a life as a Christian but when you read the Old Testament and you know that, that the Israelites were brought out of the land of slavery so that they could worship the Lord, Jesus offers us a new way of worship through Him. Him being slain opens the curtain where we can come to God freely to worship Him for who He is and what He's done for us. And that's what I want to focus on today. Not just, not just that we're saved, not just that we're redeemed, not that we're made right, but that we can worship God for who He is. That's why we were created. We were created to be in a relationship with Him, but to worship Him and give Him thanks because He is so awesome. But instead, we use the word awesome, awe-inspiring, for something like ice cream with hot fudge on it. God is awesome, and He loves you so much 
that Jesus would come into Jerusalem and they would lay down the palm branches and say, Hosanna, save us. But when they didn't see the kind of Messiah they wanted to see, then later that week they would yell, crucify him, crucify him. And even the authorities and the kings and principalities of this world would say, we don't find any, when he fought in this man, don't you want us to release this, this insurrectionist, this murderer instead? And they said, no, crucify Jesus. Crucify him. All the wonderful things that he did, the mighty miracles that he did, him without sin came to dwell and live among us so that he could be slain for us. And no one took his life. He gave his life. He is our ultimate high priest. He is our king. He is our Lord. He is Jesus, the name above all names. And that was God's plan from the beginning. So many times we say, oh, I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. But you're saved so that you can worship God for what He's done for you. The children of Israel were saved from, from the Egyptians and everything. And as soon as they got out in the desert and they saw the mighty miracles and everything, they longed to go back. To go back where they had the things that they had. They didn't want to wander around in the wilderness and... And not have but God provided for them. He was there. They could see His presence. They could feel the rumbling of the mountain. They had Moses speaking the word to them. But yet they still longed to go back. And Jesus says something about that. He says, anyone that chooses to be a disciple of mine and looks longingly back doesn't deserve the kingdom of heaven. Once you put your hand to the plow, you're here to plow. You're here to work for the kingdom because of what God has done for you. And that is part of your worship to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, prudent act of service. If you read in your scriptures this past week, you read Exodus chapters 11 through 16. I know that was a lot more than normal, wasn't it? And Deuteronomy 5 through 8, so that you could see some of that law and see the things that were set forth to the Israelites about worship. Because in our Western Christianity, we kind of miss out on that sometimes. And we don't even like to read some of that part of the Old Testament. When we were going to the airport, um, Pat asked about the Old Testament God. And I was like, I well, should have been talking about this long before, 15 minutes for a flight, but that's okay. And I said, what do you see? She said, I see a God that's angry and everything. I said, I see a God that's loving because of the stiff-necked, rebellious people. And she said, I see that too. And I said, that's how you have to look at that, that God is so faithful, so kind, so loving, so, so long-suffering because His people continually, even though He does so much for them and does so many mighty, wonderful works, we long to go back to something else. And that's exactly what Palm Sunday is about. Jesus coming into Jerusalem as a recognized Messiah, the King that would save them. But because He wasn't there to take away the Roman oppression and to lift them up in this world with things, with, with taking care of my needs and everything else, that's not the kind of Savior we want. But Jesus was clear, if anyone will come after me, he must deny himself Take up his cross and follow after me. He is the humble servant, the lamb that was slain for us so that we could be made right with God, so that we could thank God and worship God. As you read those chapters in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, you should have thought about what it means to hear and obey. You should have also thought of what about what it means to grumble and complain. <laughs> God made a conditional covenant with them and they broke that covenant over and over and over again. He gave them daily bread to sustain them in this world and how much more do we need the daily bread of Jesus to sustain us, sustain us spiritually forever and ever and ever. Sherry and I talked about that some as we were gone. We ate out a lot. I have no clue how much weight I've gained. <laughs> but you know, I feed my body and I long to feed my body do I long as much to feed my soul with the bread of life? I should. I should strive to do that more than I do my physical body. In fact, that's how Jesus was tempted in the, des in the desert, in the wilderness by Satan. Now we have an unconditional covenant. Jesus slain for us. And by faith, anyone who believes is saved. Period. You're a new creation in Christ. How are you going to view God? 
How are you going to worship Him? How are you going to live your life? Scripture's clear. You're supposed to live your life differently. You're to let your light shine so that your good deeds glorify God who is in heaven. Is this how you live? How much more should we hear and obey? How much more should we not grumble and complain for the sacrifice of Jesus that was given for us? Sealing us for all time. And then we've got the sanctuary and the Holy Spirit coming in and tabernacling with us, living with us, dwelling with us, sealing us and, and proclaiming that we are God's child. As Paul says, that it's just a little bit of a, a glimpse of what our true inheritance is as children of God. The Israelites never fathomed that way. They were a nation. They were called you know, children of God. But we are His adopted children. You are His very own beloved child. Beloved so much that He would give His son's life up to put you as a son or daughter of His. Wow. So are you hearing Jesus' voice and are you following in His footsteps? So let us consider Hebrews 10 as we do this and what was said here. In Hebrews 10 chapter one, uh, verse 1, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason it can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year make perfect those who draw near to worship. We are made perfect. Verse 2, otherwise would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. Do you feel guilty for your sins? Do you feel the shame, the nakedness that you have because of your sins against God? You deserve His wrath. God's wrath. Not my wrath. Not the sheriff's wrath. Not the president's wrath. God's wrath. The creator of all things. The sustainer of all things. Things we cannot even comprehend. But that's exactly why Jesus came to take that wrath upon His shoulders so that we wouldn't have to face it. Verse 3, But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. Think about that as we're in this week, this Holy Week, and the scriptures that you're to read are, are a different theme for each one, so you can see that. And we, we end this week with, The Lord is my shepherd. I don't need anything. He's with me no matter where I'm at, be it in the valley lows or the mountain highs. He fills me up and my cup runs over even. Is Jesus your shepherd? Verse 4 of Hebrews 10, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, He said, Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. A body, just like we are spirit and body, flesh and blood, but we are spirit as well. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scrolls. I have come to do your will, my God. For he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, they, though they were offered in accordance to the law. Then he said, Here I am. I have come to do your will. Quoting from Psalms 40. Are you willing to do God's will? Jesus taught us to pray that way. Not my will, but His. His kingdom come, not my kingdom come. But so many times we're back to that same way that we were before we accepted Jesus. Before we believed. We still long for the ways things were in Egypt, in Babylon. Those things that please us. Those things that satisfy us. Those things that even become idols because they're the things that we put our trust and our faith and our hope in instead of in God Almighty. He sets aside the first to establish the second. Verse 10, And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But when this priest 
had offered for all time one sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. He is interceding for us just as the Holy Spirit is interceding for us inside of us, transforming, transforming us, revealing Jesus to us as we walk through this world in flesh and in our spirit. <clears throat> and since that time he awaits, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. You are sanctified when you believe and you are sanctified through and through as you let the Holy Spirit walk you through this world. As you learn to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow after Jesus. As you are changed by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God into the image of Jesus Christ Himself. To be like Jesus, His hands and feet in this world. That means what used to be is unfamiliar. You don't look like that anymore. You don't act like that. You don't rely on that. Instead, you fix your eyes on Jesus, which we'll get to in Hebrews, because He is the author and perfecter of our faith. And you become more and more like Him. And those things that you used to desire and used to long for, those sins that you had, become so unfamiliar that you would never even dream about doing those things that you used to do. And then the world sees that and says, Why? Tell me about it. Why, why do you live this way now? Why do you do these good things? Why do you love even the unlovable? So is that the path that you're on? For by one sacrifice He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. For He says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put law, my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. We don't have to write them on the doorpost anymore, do we, Merle? They're written in our mind and in our heart, and our heart compels us to say the things that we say and do the things that we do, because God's laws are written right here. You don't need a preacher. You've got the Holy Spirit, which will reveal God's truth to you as you read His Word and as you pray to Him. Wow. All of this because Jesus Christ laid down His life. The temple veil was torn in two. You have direct access to God as a child of His. Where by the Spirit you can cry, Abba, Father. The Aramaic word for daddy. Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. So you don't have to listen to Satan when he says you're unworthy. You can't do this, anything else. It was all finished when Jesus Christ said it is finished. Period. You are God's child. <laughs> you get a glimpse of that in your own life with a child. You love them. No matter what they do, you continue to love them. If you're a decent father or mother, decent, then how much more does God love you, especially if He gave His Son to save you? That's the testimony that you have to others. Whether they understand it or not, that's not your responsibility again. But it is your responsibility to tell them of the hope that you have if you in fact have that hope. And where there have been forgiven where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Verse 19, Therefore, because of all this, listen up, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, the place that the high priest could only go once a year and had to sprinkle blood everywhere. And we talked about the massive amount of blood that was shed and everything else. You can go into the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way open to us through the curtain that is His body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled, just like the things were in the temple, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. For, we ha for he who promised is faithful. Now remember the Hebrews are, the reason this letter is being written is because so many things in their life at that time are distracting them and pulling them away. And the author is afraid that they'll be adrift out in sea, not knowing where they were headed. And you've got this firm confidence here. So hold to it, be anchored to Jesus 
and let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we say that we have. That means we're not wishy-washy, being tossed all around. Oh, that reminds me of what James said, if you read James. Not being tossed around because that kind of faith isn't faith at all. For he who promised is faithful. God will do it in you, through you, for you. It's all about God and how wonderful and mighty He is. Are you praising and worshiping Him for what He has done for you? Verse 24, So let us consider then how we may spur one another towards love and good deeds. Any of you ride? I don't anymore, really. <laughs> I don't have horses anymore. But you spur them, they react, trust me. They react to it. Let us consider how we can cause you to react to God's grace, His love, His mercy, His provision, His kindness, His goodness, the hope that you profess. Let us consider how we can spur each other to be like Jesus in this world. Not just sit in church. Be the church. Be like Jesus. Not giving up meeting together, as some get in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as the, you see the day approaching. Now, I know some of you will say, well, it's been 2,000 years. I don't know when it's going to happen. Well, today is one day closer than yesterday was, isn't it? And no man knows the hour, and shouldn't we be living as today was our last day to breathe and live for God, to worship Him, to live by the power of the Holy Spirit? <clears throat> Verse 26, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left. Jesus will not be crucified again. It was finished on the cross. You either believe that by faith and your life shows it or you don't. Now, yes, you don't have to have your life show it. The thief on the cross didn't. But if you're breathing and living now, your life should show it. You should grow up. The author of Hebrews has already told you that so that you can be mature, so that you can be more like Christ. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left. But, verse 27, only a fearful expectation of judgment and the raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what Jesus said because He took that on His shoulder so you wouldn't have to. He took all the beating, all the abuse, all the, the prayer that He was in the garden saying, take this cup from me if you can, and He sweated drops of blood. He took all of that from you so that you could have confidence to know that your sins have been forgiven. They will be remembered no more. And not only that, you have direct access to the Father, the Holy Spirit, tabernacles and lives in and with you changing you through and through. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and who has insulted the Spirit of grace. That's one of the most sobering verses in the Bible. Jesus Christ, our Passover Lamb, laid down His life so that you could be brought back into the presence of God, a right relationship with Him, so you could do just like we were when we were originally created. Worship Him. Praise Him. Give Him thanks. And how much more do we see that? Because He gave His Son to put us back to this relationship. And we couldn't do it here, we can't do it now, but the Holy Spirit lives in us, so the Holy Spirit does it through us. So the more that we read God's Word, the more that we pray, the more that we rely on the Spirit, the more that we can't help but say because His laws are written in our mind and on our heart, praise God from whom all blessings flow. You can't help but do it. Verse 30, four, prepositional phrase, we know him who said, it is mine to avenge. I will repay again and again. The Lord will judge his people. Pat asked me, she said, why did the, God tell them to destroy all the foreign lands? I said, because God had already given them opportunity to repent. 
I said, and we see that. Rahab the prostitute repented. We don't know how many others repented and came to worship the God of Israel. But when he says judgment has come, guess what's come? Judgment. Period. And you've been saved by the blood of the Lamb, so you should proclaim the praises of God Almighty, for He is gracious, kind, wonderful, beyond anything that we can fathom. His ways are so much higher than ours. And any trust that we put in any earthly things, He is the creator of all those things. And without Him, there would be no good whatsoever. And He loved you enough that He created you, and He loved you enough that He gave His Son to die for you, because He said, come back to me. It is a dreadful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Remember those early days after you received the light when you endured in a great conflict of suffering? Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution, and other times you stood side by side those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your properties because you knew that you yourselves had, a better, had better and lasting possessions. I can't fathom those verses because that hadn't happened to me because of my faith. These things happened to the Hebrews because of their faith in Jesus Christ. So no wonder they were doubting in everything. Our Western society of Christianity teaches so much, God will bless you and you will prosper. That's so foreign to what the Bible says. If you are being blessed, bless others. Tell of the praises. Because if you're not going to worship and praise God while you're being blessed, you're certainly not going to when you're persecuted. The devil's going to pour himself out on you then and say, turn from God. Will you give him praise and glory and honor while you can? Will you listen to the call of the Holy Spirit? Will you read and study the Word of God so that you're an approved workman who needs not to be ashamed, who rightly can divide the Word of truth? Will you thank Him for what Jesus Christ has done for you? Verse 35, So don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised you. you I remind you again, you're a child of God. Everything that He is, has, you inherit And you can start pulling from that inheritance now because the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. The Holy Spirit will give you gifts. The Holy Spirit will teach you. The Holy Spirit will do these things for you as you seek to do the Father's will so that you can say even when you're in prison, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength so that you can write a letter to people and say, hey, the, the people inside the jail are getting saved. I didn't know that was going to happen, but I'm here and I'm preaching to them and they're getting saved. So don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. For in just a little while, He who is coming will come and will not delay. Jesus Christ will return. And He brings His reward with Him. And He will separate the sheep and the goats. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And, but my righteous one, they will live differently. They will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. My righteous one will live by faith. We're getting to get to Hebrews chapter 11, and we'll see all those examples. I will live differently. How could Abraham even think of sacrificing the son that was supposed to bring him the promises that God... How does that even work? Except the author of Hebrews adds more to that story and says, he reasoned that God could raise Isaac from the dead. Wow. If that's not the Holy Spirit guiding you and leading you in faith. Oh, and in Hebrews 11 it says, without faith it's impossible to please God, doesn't it? My righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. 
But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed. We belong but to those who have faith and are saved. You know, Jesus died. He was our sacrificial lamb so that we could worship God. And guess what? And we'll be saved. It's not we're saved. It's I can worship God and He's going to save me. Like I said, we think about the salvation, but then we fail to think about the holiness of God and the worship that He deserves. So we say, I'm saved and I know it. My life might show it. Instead, of my life will surely show it. I'm saved and I know it. And yeah, I'll get rid of some of these things in my life rather than all these things are foreign to me. I'm going to live for He who died for me. How is your faith? Today is what we call Palm Sunday. It begins the Holy Week. And the readings that you read, you should contemplate and pray on what Jesus Christ went through, what He did for you, the final teachings that He did during that Holy Week, whatever you need to consider. And like I said, Friday, I'm going to get here at 6 a.m. and start with Scripture that I put to each hour from 3 to 6. It's going to be dark. Time for prayer. Do I want to sit here all day? Do I have things I need to get to do? Yeah. But if I can't come and sit from 6 a.m. till roughly 8 p.m. after we play the movie and think about what God did for me, then I'm certainly not going to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy to remember the rest that I have for eternity in heaven if I can't take one day out of my schedule. The things that Jesus went through for me, for you, because He loved you and because He did the Father's will, not His own. He did not even consider equality with God something to be used for His gain. In Luke 19, this is some of Jesus' final words when He comes into the uh, city on Palm Sunday. It says, go to the village, this is verse 30 of Luke 19, go to the village ahead of you and as you enter it you will find a colt there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you're untying it, say the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They, re they replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Praising God because the Messiah had come, the Christ, the chosen one of Israel, the anointed one. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus is king. They recognize this. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But some of the Pharisees, some of the religious in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Jesus replied, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. The children of God who would not accept Jesus as the Messiah because Jesus wasn't the kind of Messiah they wanted that gave them daily bread and cured them of their diseases and filled their tummies. When yet He wants to give you so much more. He wants to give you a glimpse of God and His glory. He wants to, to take you and let you dwell with God and the Spirit transform you into His very image and give you a home for all eternity. Jesus said in verse 42, If, if you, even you, had only known of this day what, what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. That happened, people. A.D. 70, Jerusalem was destroyed. They were dispersed as a nation. Oh, they've come back to as a nation now. Oh, signs of the end times, for sure. You talk about that. But they did not recognize Jesus as the Messiah, as the King. And they were destroyed. 
How much more do you think God is going to destroy those, we read it in Hebrews, who trample what Jesus Christ did on the cross? who take the holiness of the blood of the covenant and trample upon it and say, I'm saved, but I'm not going to change my life or give up these things. Your life was purchased with the price of God Himself. <clears throat> Do you recognize what Jesus has done for you? the sin debt that he canceled that you owed to God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Have you been purchased by the blood of the Lamb? Are you living out this great salvation that has been offered to you? Are you living by faith? For without faith it's impossible to please God. Are you worshiping God? with the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the High Priest, Jesus Christ, who sacrificed and gave His life for you. Jesus will come again. If you go backwards in Luke 19, verse 11 says, While they were listening to this, He went to, the, to tell them a parable. Because He was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. Okay, we just talked about when he came into Jerusalem, they said, Hosanna, King, we recognize you. But he told them this parable prior, so I'm going backwards in Luke. He said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king, and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work. What you've been given, you are a steward of the grace of God given to you, the power of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you, the testimony of Jesus Christ you are to herald. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He, he, has been, he was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. Okay, I've got to ask you again. You believe in Jesus Christ. You say that I'm a Christian. Is he your king? Are you living out his commandments? Are you sheep that are following his voice? Because listen to this parable. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. Is the Spirit transforming you into the image of Christ? Or are you still a baby? Or are you not a baby at all? The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities, whatever that means. The second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. So he's given a mind of this servant is. I was afraid of you. He's got the fear of the king. Because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Then didn't you put then why didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back I could have at least collected interest Then he said to those standing by take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas Sir they said he already has 10 he replied I tell you that everyone who has more will be given but as for the one who has nothing wait a minute didn't he have a mina Even what he what they have will be taken away but those enemies of mine, who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Now I wonder what happened to that last servant who had a mina that was taken from him. I'm not here to explain all that. That's not my point. This is a parable for you. He was a servant. He was given a mina, but it was taken away. And then Jesus said, take these enemies of mine and kill them. I don't know about you. I want to hear, well done. With what you've given me, I have produced a crop. Because I have lived a life that proclaims Jesus Christ. Others have seen it and they ask me then, tell me about your faith. 
And it's not up to me to save them, but it is up to me to live like Christ so that they ask me and then I can proclaim. That's what you're supposed to do if it's written on your heart and in your mind. If the Spirit lives inside of you, you are a steward of what Jesus Christ has given you through His sacrifice. The purchasing you back to God. Are you an obedient servant? Or are you still living as an enemy of Christ? Jesus is coming soon. He will separate the sheep from the goats and He will reward those who seek after Him. Oh, let's go back a little further in Luke 19. Let's go back to verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. You know him. He was a wee little man, right? He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, harder than it is for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle, whatever that means. Verse 3, he wanted to see who Jesus was. This Jesus is intriguing to me. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. Since Jesus was coming that way, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and they began to mutter, He is gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, not to the crowd, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. He has the faith of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost those that recognize their sin, recognize they can't put their hope in the things of this world and say, I will give it up to serve you. I know I'm a sinner. I've done wrong. I will do what I can, but I can't do it again. But you can do it for me by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me, by your word that transforms me, that, that pierces to, even to the dividing of soul and spirit. I don't comprehend that, but that's okay because I know it will change me. It will cut, it will hurt, but it will change me into the image of Christ. Salvation is yours, but you've got to come down out of that tree, don't you? And then you've got to decide if you're really going to follow Jesus or not. Because just because you come down out the tree doesn't mean you're following Christ. Do you get the point? Oh, but I was saved. I've gone to church. I was baptized. If you came down off that tree, you realized you were a sinner, and then you turned towards God and away from the wicked deeds that you did. And Christ is that dividing point because He paid the price for you. He came to seek and save the lost. Last time I preached, I read Revelation 4 and 5. It was a glimpse of the throne room in heaven in that worship. I want to close with reading a little bit from Revelation chapter 7. In Revelation chapter 6, it talked about the day that all those seals are opened. Worthy is the Lamb. But in chapter 7, we see a little bit more about worship. Before, we saw the elders and, and the beings in heaven and everything. And in Revelation chapter 7, we see about people worshiping in heaven. Revelation chapter 7 verse 9, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their heads. <laughs> Just like that day 2,000 years ago on that Palm Sunday. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. They were saved so they could worship God forever and ever and ever in heaven. Where every tear will be wiped. Where there is no sting of death. Where there is peace, peace, peace. Love, love, love. 
They cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praising glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are those, these are they who have come out of a great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple in heaven. And he sits on the and he who sits on the throne and shelters them with his presence. Jesus cried out and wept over Jerusalem and said, how I love to, would love to cover you under my wings as a, as a female hen would do her chicks. Never again, verse 16, will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. See, here's the thing. Jesus cries out to each and every one of you like this. Alan, come down out of that tree because I've come to be with you and salvation has come to your house today if you'll accept that. If you'll come down out of that tree, if you'll forsake all and come follow after me, I will make you a fisher of men. And you will spend eternity forgiven of your sins forever and ever in the throne room of God worshiping and praising Him rather than that other place. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for Jesus Christ, the lamb that was slain for us, so that we could truly worship you for who you are. We could truly live the life that you created us to live. God, you are so worthy of praise beyond what we can even fathom. Lord, help us as we read the Old Testament to, to see this because it, it's more unfamiliar to our, us in Christianity in the world today. But you are a holy God and you require a holy people. And Jesus Christ is the one who has sanctified us through and through. And Lord, as we yield to your spirit, you will sanctify us more and more. We will grow from childhood into maturity to be more and more like Christ. We will be his hands and feet in this world and you've called us together to be a community of believers a community of followers of Jesus Christ the church so that we could be presented as a spotless bride when he returns together with the children of Israel all under the faith of Abraham for we are to live by faith not by sight fixing our eyes on Jesus and we thank you and praise you for the finished work that he did on the cross. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I forgot, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I forgot I have one more prayer request um, for Catherine, who has been so excited about going to women's retreat with us, may not be able to go. She is having some kind of nerve problems that keeps her from sleeping at night. So if you could just put her on your prayer list and um, have the Lord heal her so she can go because she's so excited to be involved in that again. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder